I'd like to talk to you today about why most intelligent people reject Christianity. Uh, yes, you heard this right. I'm going to be very honest in this study and um, show you what the Bible has to say about this subject. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'll begin there. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Many people think that uh, they view the Bible through the lens of organized religion. They say, well, I've seen Christians do this and I've seen churches do that and I remember this Pope said this. And that, but they're judging the Scriptures not according to the Scriptures but according to church buildings. That's not the right way to do it. And if you actually read the Bible, you'll see that the Bible itself is against organized religion. But let's look here, see what the Bible says about itself. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 through 29. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, are called. God doesn't choose very many people that are of high intellect. It's what it says. Okay? I'm not trying to be mean or nasty or really bad towards Christians. I'm reading what the Bible itself says. Verse 27, But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. Uh, verse 29, that no flesh should glory in his presence. The Bible itself says that God doesn't choose the most highly intellectual people for salvation. God chooses the people who are uneducated, the simple people, the people who can come and believe in simple faith. That's what the scripture says. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, over chapter 2 to chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18 through 20. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, if you are of high intellect, let him become a fool that he may be wise. I'll explain this. It's some really deep, profound stuff coming up in this study. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. I'll show you what that means here in a little bit. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. I'm going to show you exactly what those last two verses mean in this study here. Romans chapter 1. We'll go there next. Romans chapter 1, verse 19 through verse 23. Okay? Verse 19, Romans 1, 19 says, Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. Say, what showed what unto us? You're looking at behind me here. Let me show you. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Hmm. Let me make it very plain for you. Okay. Here I have an old Timex watch I've had for many years. Takes a licking, keeps on ticking. Timex. <laughs> Remember those old commercials from when I was a boy. Um... Now, is this created by intelligent design? You say, yes. How about this? A piece of birch bark. Oh, well, that came from a random accident billions of years ago that exploded when nothing got together and, you know, compressed into a small little tiny dot and it spun around faster and faster till it exploded and and then it came, became goo, and it was a fern for a while, and then it eventually evolved into this. A bark that's waterproof, but yet also flammable. Hmm. You can make a canoe out of this. You can make something that can hold a, a thing of water with this. And yet it can also start your fire. Huh. And I can rip this off of this tree right here, and it doesn't kill the tree. So I have a basically an endless supply of birch bark wherever I go. 
I can also put a tap into this tree right here that you can barely see it's kind of off camera a little bit but I can put a tap into this tree in the spring early spring and I can get the sap out of that and it's got medicinal qualities to it and it tastes really good too it's got a little bit of sweetness to it the little bit of sugar that the tree has in it over here this tree which you can not really see too good either but this is a balsam fir tree it's got these little bumps on it little things there and if I poke that little bump sap will come out comes out and it can heal your wounds it's very uh, antimicrobial and antibacterial and all the other things very good and these two came from a common ancestor the fir tree and the birch tree came from a common ancestor here's another fir tree right here here's another birch tree back here and this all came from a common ancestor billions of years ago but this watch was created you see when you start to worship and serve the creature and the creation rather than the creator you become a fool the fool has said in his heart there is no god now just let me speak to you for a minute if you say it would be illogical to say that this was self-creating this watch came from an explosion in a um, hardware store or something there was an explosion everything just blew up and you came in and there was a whole bunch of watches like this laying on the floor ticking you see well, that's absurd that wouldn't be logical but it's logical to say that everything out here and just i'm pointing at two different species of trees what about the mushrooms what about the birds what about the insects what about everything the invisible things of the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and godhead so that they are without excuse you have no excuse evolution is a stupid theory all right but what's it for why did they make it to get rid of the existence of god because you see it's more than just well god created things and he doesn't care what you do no god actually has rules in his word written out and i'm going to show you that that's really the real reason why intellectual people why they don't believe in the bible and there's another also another big reason which i'll also get into which i'm going to get you with it okay you think that you'll get away from me and well you know this guy's too big of an idiot he doesn't you know say things perfectly and whatever well i just prefer to do my videos without a lot of editing because it's more real that way okay i could edit out all the times i make mistakes and don't read a word exactly correctly and stammer around a little bit i could edit that all out and have a nice studio and i could be wearing a suit and tie and everything i could do that stuff but that's not real okay i'm going to speak to you in such a way that if you ever meet me out in public and you get to talking to me, you'll see he's the same guy off camera as he is on camera. That's who I am. That's what I believe in. All right. That's what this ministry is all about. But you see, logically, anyone who has a logical brain can look at this out here and say, well, I'll, I'll be ag agnostic. If you truly have any kind of an, a high IQ or anything else at the, you know, you have to at least say, okay, if I'm really honest, I would be an agnostic. I don't know. Agnostic. I'm agnostic. You know, agnostic. You know, a before something means that you don't believe it or whatever else. Um, I have, I am without knowledge. Ag agnostic. That's what it means. Atheist means I don't believe in God. All right. Uh, which is rather foolish because you haven't experienced everything, nor can you experience everything. You have to say, well, okay, let me be open-minded. Let me be scientific. I have not seen proof of God's existence. Well, out here, you can see proof of God's existence. A lot of the problem is that a lot of you live in the city, and you don't get out here very much, and you don't see this, what God created. You're just surrounded by what man created. And you, so you think that man is the measure of all things. That's very foolish. Because what man creates um, is not very good when you compare it to the natural world but i'm going to show you that that's not the real reason why people reject god and reject the bible all right i will show you the real reason what's really going on um colossians chapter 2 verse 8 i'm going to give you the real reason why people reject the notion of there being a god and the bible that again i'm not going to be see another thing that frees me intellectually when i preach um 
I don't have a church building for you to come to. A lot of people think I do. I don't want a church building ever for any reason because then I'd get the groupies that would come and, and oh, Brother Brian, we love Brother Brian, and they'd be there to worship me. That's detestable. Um, and then I'd get people that would come and try to make trouble and try to draw away disciples and try to... It'd be just a miserable time of fighting. And, you know, I've been in church buildings. I've preached in pulpits. I don't want one, okay? Um, so that frees me up intellectually because I don't rely on any of you out there to pay the mortgage on my building or to make me feel legitimate or something else. So I'm going to be honest with you where other preachers will not. Other preachers are after your money. They want you to get you, they want to get you into their church building someplace and come and worship them. That's what they really want. I don't. Okay, I'm trying to put you in touch with Jesus Christ and his word, the King James Bible for English speaking people. All right, the greatest book ever written, by the way, too, and you can verify that scientifically. No other book has been published and printed as much as this King James Bible. And you read it, it's a beautiful book. All right, it's not been corrupted with all the modern, um, you know, slang and whatever street talk and things. This book is a beautiful book. There's a lot of poetic things in it, you know, and it's a great book. You should read it sometime with an open mind and actually see there are no church buildings in this book. There's no suit and tie. There's no Sunday best. There's no, you know, whatever, soul winning in the New Testament where we go out on crusades and have bus ministries and bring children, you know, get people's children away from them and take them to Sunday school and vacation Bible school. There's no scripture for any of that stuff. And uh, the Catholic Church, are you kidding me? There's no scripture for that stuff either. There's no Pope. There's no uh, Blessed Sacrament, Eucharist, Transubstantiation, Auricular Confession, big cathedrals. Uh, none of that stuff is there. Priests, nuns, monks, Gregorian chants, <laughs> all that stuff. It's not there. But I'll show you what the real problem is here. Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. Boom, right there. I have seen atheists that are, you get to talking to them and things, and they will get to the point where they'll say, okay, you know, I, I will step down from being an atheist and I will say, okay, I am agnostic. I haven't seen proof yet that God exists. You can say that there's intelligent design. There must be an intelligent designer. I get it. Logically, I can agree to that. But the problem comes in when you say, but if there is a God that's all powerful and controls everything, why would he let suffering come in? Why would that God allow wars and horrible things like that? Why would God have certain people that never hear the gospel and they die and they end up in hell for all of eternity when they've never heard the gospel? And you come out with all of these things and what is it? Philosophy. Okay, and if you want to really break that down, philios or philo, uh, their philosophy would be a lover of Sof, you know, Sophie or whatever it would be. Basically, the word breaks down to a lover of wisdom, somebody that likes to read a lot, somebody that is very educated, that, that is always trying to learn something. And they go to university and they have multiple earned degrees and whatever else. You have a philosopher. Okay, but the problem is uh, you don't really know God. You can't really say that I can understand, I can go and I can learn enough wisdom and get enough understanding up in my mind that I can then understand God and understand why he does certain things. See, you and your finite wisdom, you're thinking to yourself, to me, this doesn't make sense. Why would he design it that way? Why would this happen and why would that happen? And what happens is you get spoiled by your love of wisdom. That's the real truth of the matter. And I know that that's true. Okay, let me give you a couple examples um, of worldly philosophies that can mess you up. These are very popular ones. Worldly philosophy number one. I don't want to have children. I don't want to bring children into this world because there are too many people. And there's also bad things and all this other stuff. So why would I subject a child to all this horror and everything else? Okay. Um, you can get spoiled by philosophy like that. Uh, go into the whole men going their own way thing. You don't want to get married or even you get married and people say, well, we're going to be career people and we won't have children. We'll spoil our nephews and nieces, but we personally don't want to bring children into the world. 
because of all the suffering and, suffering and misery and everything else. Um, that's a worldly philosophy and it can spoil you. I can tell you, um, I did not have a child up until the time I was um, 39 years old. Okay? And I just kind of thought, well, I'm probably never going to get married. I'm too weird or whatever else. And I got married when I was 36. Three years later, we had our son Oliver. He just celebrated his 10th birthday a number of days ago, a week or two ago here in September. And um, that little boy has brought more joy and happiness into my life than any other material possession I've ever had. Um, and I've had some pretty neat stuff. I've had motorcycles. I've had Corvettes. I've gone on to foreign countries, to tropical destinations and things like that. And um, there's nothing as special as having a baby and realizing the, the love between a man and a woman and it produces this little baby and you're holding them in your arms and they look up to you and they put their little hand up and they touch your face and then they pull your beard. <laughs> Just being honest. Um, still love them. And they cry. And you get up. You sacrifice your own sleep. And with charity, you walk over there and you get them and you, oh, shh, it's okay, it's all right. You hold them. And you feel them calming down and they go to back to sleep in your arms. You're never going to find that kind of joy in anything else. Ever. I love dogs. Cats, I'm a little bit indifferent with them. Some are okay, but you know, uh, I love dogs, but you know what? Um, it's not the same as having your own child. It really isn't. Um, so don't let that worldly philosophy mess you up. If you're an intellectual out there and you're thinking to yourself, I don't know if I want to have a child. Throw caution to the wind, friend. Have a child, okay? Get married to somebody that you love, that you truly support, that you want to spend the rest of your days with, and have a child, okay? Um, because another thing, God will reveal a lot of character about himself to you when you're a father and you're dealing with that son. It's a beautiful thing the thing of self-sacrifice and whatever else. And now all of a sudden you might start to understand God a little bit better if you do things God's way. Something very simple. That just the simple people, the simple-minded people, not the highly educated, you know, the laity. They have children all the time. And a lot of them, I mean, there are some real screw-ups out there. Thank you, Hollywood, for destroying the, you know, the nuclear family, as it's called. Uh, Hollywood has done more to destroy... Um, family values and things than anything else out there. But, you know, at a, there was a time when families were a lot more united. And of course, you know, I know the logical mind, the logical mind says, well, I can overthrow the, the rule with the exception. So I can say, well, even back in the past, there were still divorces, there were still bad families, there were still bad things. So that proves, that proves that you're spoiled by philosophy, friend, is all that that proves. Um, there are bad relationships out there. That means you should never have a relationship. There are bad drivers. There are bad vehicles. That means you should never have, uh, you should never drive a vehicle. Um, there are bad things that happen to people out in the forest. Well, that means you should never come out into the forest. You see, you're being spoiled by philosophy. My recommendation to you, if you're still young enough, is find somebody, get married, have children. It's very natural. Okay, God chooses the simple things to confound the wise. You'll understand some of God's character when you're a parent and you say, you know what? I have to be there to protect my child. I have to be there to control my child's life. Don't put that battery in your, in your mouth. Don't put that toy in your mouth. Don't you put that. Don't swallow that marble. Eat your food. Okay. You need to learn how to go potty. You need to be a big girl. You need to be a big boy. Time to sit down on the potty, the training potty. Okay. Come on. Take your first steps. And all of a sudden you start to understand God a little bit better. You start to understand God having grace, giving people free will. Yes, being there to control. Yes, being there to dictate and things, but also saying, you need to do this thing. You need to have a free will. Worldly philosophy number two. Religion is the opium of the masses or opiate of the masses or whatever else Karl Marx said, um, that demented nut that he was. Religion is just, a, it's, Pipe dreams, people, weak-minded, lowly educated people, they need religion. Um, well, actually, if you do some study, 
you know, there are plenty of studies out there that actually say that people that believe in religion and pray and whatever else, they actually lead healthier, happier lives. Okay, um, you say, how do you know that? Uh, because I tried the atheistic approach as a professing Christian. I tried to find joy and peace in the things that you have to offer out there, that the world has to offer. Atheistic ways and watch whatever movie you want, drink whatever you want, do whatever you want. Sexual perversion, there, there are no rules, there is no God, just do what you want. Be happy in life. I've tried it, okay? And it doesn't bring happiness and it doesn't bring peace. Um, this might shock some of you, and I'm not going to say this out of pride, but uh, I have a fairly high IQ. Okay, there's a lot of skills that I have, a lot of things I've been trained in. I've read quite a few books and things in my life. Um, I'm a little bit rude in speech, I realize, but not in knowledge. Um, I was a, um, you know, artist many years ago, going to some of the highest art shows out there, having my work in a lot of art galleries and things. I've been around the higher echelon of people before I became a radical preacher. <laughs> um, so I know, I know about that stuff. I know about that world. And yet, I don't want to go back to that because I didn't have joy and I didn't have peace in that world. I have it now as a simple man. And there are times that my logical brain, sometimes I think to myself, I don't get an answer to prayer and I think, am I really, did I get into the right thing here? Am I kind of a little dumb? I fell for the wrong. And the philosophy starts to come in and I start to kind of question some things. And I have to say, okay, wait a second. Go out for a walk in the woods. You know, I walk around. And did this come to uh, about by chance? Did that come about by chance? Did all this stuff out here? No. Okay, the Creator. Yeah. All right. Um, his word is real. It's true. I've proven it over and over again. I've been through a lot of theological studies and put out a lot of theological studies and seen not just that it changed my life, but it changed millions of people's lives. People were willing to die for this book. People wrote hymns. Uh, I can be in really bad shape, real deep depression, and I can sing a hymn, and it lifts my spirits, and nothing else can do that. And, and I, okay, Lord, I'm sorry. Forgive my unbelief, Lord. Forgive my weakness. It works. Works quite well. But you see, if I was um, spoiled by philosophy then I would start to say, well, maybe religion is false. Maybe because God didn't answer my prayer in my timing, um, then maybe there is no God. Yeah, maybe I'll just go back out to the world and I'd be stupid and go and do a bunch of stuff that you people do. Worldly philosophy number three. Success is measured by things versus godliness with contentment is great gain. First Timothy 6 verse 6 talks about that. Godliness with contentment is great gain. A lot of people, they go out there and they just break their neck trying to get the right, you know, make the right contacts and the right things and whatever else. And, you know, you see these women and they get older in life and they're career women and they're, they're still trying to look like they were when they're in their 20s or something or in their 30s. And, and, you know, just trying to dress for success and all this other stuff. And men that are just constantly trying to chase that next contract and this next thing here and you know, I just have to make this deal and this and that, whatever. You're looking for happiness in things. And you go out there and and you have your big house, probably bought through a mortgage, you know, and, and um, you have that. You have a, you've been considered very successful. You have lots of money in the bank. You can pretty much go wherever you want. And you've attained to great success. But the problem is you're still looking for more success. You're still looking. Um, you're not done yet. You don't feel any rest. And then you look and you see some simpleton, some simple country bumpkin, and um, they don't live in the biggest house. They don't drive the best vehicle. They might not, not be the uh, sharpest knife in the drawer, but they're happy and they're content and they have joy. Hmm. And you think to yourself, Read back in the book of Ecclesiastes, one of the most uh, intelligent men that ever lived, King Solomon, and you read that. The book of Ecclesiastes is, is a really good book if you're an intellectual. Read that, and you'll see the folly of it. How dieth the wise man? Has the fool? 
the thing that hath been, it's been here before. To everything there is a season. And he's musing about what he's gone through and what he's learned. I want all the women. I want all the money. I want all the success. And I've done all these things. Build houses and lands and gardens and everything out there. And you get to the end and you say, vanity of vanities. All is vanity. What was it all for? You get Henry David Thoreau and he comes out and he sits down in the woods and he just looks and he says, I'm just going to live in this shack for a while. And I'm just going to have all these really deep thoughts. Sits out here like I'm doing right now and he's listening to the birds in the trees. How do the birds fly from tree to tree without hitting the branches? We couldn't do that as men. Finest pilots couldn't fly through these branches, but yet birds do. How are they preparing for winter? A lot of these little birds, they're here year-round. Black-capped chickadees, they, there's one flying right there. What's he thinking about today? Is he thinking about his career? Is he thinking about paying off his college tuition? Is he thinking about making his mortgage payment, paying the taxes, and who's going to be elected this year as president? And What about the condition of war in Russia? No, he, he doesn't care. And pretty soon you can get rather philosophical. And you can get spoiled. Because you miss the fact that it's just a simple faith. Greatest book ever written. What does it say? It says that God came down. Because that when they knew God, they glor glorifi glorified Him not as God but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man, and birds, and four-footed beasts, and whatever else. Spoiled through philosophy. I think if there could be a God, I can certainly look out here and acknowledge that, yes, there could be a God. I can't say that there is no God. I don't know. In my experience... If you're honest, I've never met God. I've never really seen a whole lot of proof. And I see religion as it is. It's a corrupt bunch of hypocr hypocrisy and money-making and uh, it's a mess and whatever else. A lot of those people aren't any different than I am. In fact, many times, you want to know the truth? A lot of times, atheists have higher moral character than Christians. I can't believe he just said it. He's just saying that for effect. No, I mean it. I remember two sawmills I used to go to when I was a wood turner. Um, the one sawmill was run by Christians. The other sawmill was run by a bunch of beer drinking rednecks. Used profanity. Rough, tough guys had classic rock playing while you were in there. The second one, the beer drinking rednecks. Um, those guys were some of the most honest guys. They've given me good deals all the time. They're, hey, Brian, how you doing? You know, come in there. The professing Christians, they were constantly trying to rip me off. It's the truth. You say, well, okay, well then what do you do with that? Logically speaking, shouldn't your Bible, shouldn't your religion be able to change those people and make them good? Um, well, who says that they were really truly Christians? A lot of people fake it. Mm -hmm. And the Bible explains about that. Huh. Don't get spoiled by philosophy. Finally, or let's go to another verse here, 2 Timothy chapter 3. I'll talk about the, the worst thing that you can possibly do out there if you are an intellectual. And I've known intellectuals. <laughs> I have talked to some extremely, I've talked to college professors. I used to sell my work to college professors. I remember one guy, we had a great conversation. He was a professor of uh, etymology, I think, or entomology, entomology, excuse me. He studied bugs. <laughs> and um, very brilliant man, building a, a yacht out of, you know, hand tools, with hand tools and teak and a bunch of other really, you know, good woods. Very brilliant man. And we got to talking about different things. I had a great time talking to him. Um, I'm not some kind of a dumb country bumpkin that's just stupid. And like I said, there are times I will be real straight. I'm going to be completely honest with you out there. There are times I really have a hard time with my faith and my beliefs. 
And I have to go back and I have to remind myself, what does the Bible say? What about out here in nature? And I have to bring myself back down again. Say, don't listen, to, don't get philosophical. So I can relate. Believe me, I can. 2 Timothy chapter 3, um, verses 7 and 8. The Bible says, Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. Do you resist the truth? You do if you believe in evolution. Evolution says things are getting better. <laughs> How's that going? Well, you know, okay, the, the economy might be kind of going down a little bit, but, you know, and, and uh, I can look at some of the experts in the field, and yeah, it's not looking good for the dollar. We're going to have a hard landing and not a soft landing, and they're going to be lowering interest rates here in next week, a um, couple days from now, and that's probably going to start the inflation going up again, and and uh, there's, you know, this thing of Russia now, you know, Putin literally came out just the other day and said that um, if America is going, well, if NATO, excuse me, is going to be launching nuclear or missiles at Russia, then they're going to retaliate. And we're right on the doorstep of World War III and there could be nuclear weapon exchanges. And that's kind of bad. And But, okay, once we get through those things, then we'll go back to evolution and everything will be better at that point in time. <laughs> No, it won't. Okay, you're resisting the truth. The truth is, this book says that man is a sinner and it gets worse and worse until God himself has to come back and fix things on the earth. Evolution says, no, actually, things get better and better until man becomes God. Um, honey, I hate to tell you this, but uh, if man continues, there won't be anything left of this earth. Well, then we'll get in spaceships and we'll go to other country or other planets and we'll populate those planets. Then you'll destroy those planets still. Man is without hope. Isaiah chapter 55, when there. Uh, I do hope that you're listening, okay? And I want you to understand out there, if you're an atheist, and I know a lot of atheists watch me and things, and you know, mostly for entertainment, well, I'm glad I can be there for you. Um, get, a, get a good laugh or whatever at me. That's fine. I don't mind. I get a good laugh at you. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but please understand what I'm trying to do. I'm not trying to get you to join this thing called Christianity and go find a good local church and get your suit and tie and Sunday best and the whole thing. Please don't do that. Please understand. I'm trying to get you to make an intellectual decision up here to say, you know what? I believe what this book says. I come out here, I say, there has to be a creator. You know what? I'm going to have to become a fool so that I can be wise. God, make me into a fool. I want to have the joy, the simple joy that this, this peasant down the street has. This guy of low IQ, this laity. I'm a PhD, a THD. A, I have all these different earned degrees. I just want to be a fool. Show me the joy of going for a walk in the woods. Show me the joy of my children laughing. Show me the joy of catching a fish with a fishing rod out on a little trip with my children. Going out and having a picnic with my wife. And laughing because the, the, it's starting to rain and we have to quickly get the stuff back in. We're laughing like a bunch of idiots till we get our simple pleasures. That's what I want for you. I've been there with all the intellectual upper crust elite people and whatever as an artist. I've been around those circles. And I know how miserable those people are. I want something better for you. I found something better. Isaiah 55, verses 6 through 11. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bud, bring forth, and bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. 
It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. You know, it's nice to uh, sometimes be driven someplace. You know, if there's a, a place that I'm supposed to go to where I don't know I'm going, and I can find somebody that does know how to get there, it's nice just to kind of let them take over. Let them get in the driver's seat and say, how many times have you been there? Oh, hundreds of times. Okay. If you don't mind, I'm just going to kind of get in the back there. I'll enjoy the scenery. I'll play little games with my son. We'll, have, we'll laugh and we'll have a fun time and whatever else. I'll talk to my wife. I don't even have to look up ahead and pay attention to the road signs and how far till we turn off the exit here and whatever else. I'm just going to trust the driver. That's the mark of a real Christian. I trust what the Bible says. I trust that Jesus died for my sins. I trust that there is a God. I don't have to know everything about Him. And I don't want to get spoiled by philosophy, trying to figure out all this stuff. I can't figure it out. I mean, how are you going to figure out what happened years ago? Uh, I want to know that how the earth was created. You can't. You can't go back. Well, I believe it came from random explosion from nothing where, you know, Everything blew up that came from nothing. Well, and then it slowly evolved and whatever. Um, well, okay, if that's what you want. But you see, the real issue with the atheists that I've found is it's a life of torture and torment. Because what atheists do, they will study religion. They will study all that stuff. And they'll say, okay, I can point out inconsistencies so therefore, I can use that as justification for my unbelief. I can say because I found errors out there, then it must not be true. Um, you know, if I was really an atheist, I wouldn't waste any time studying the Bible or religion or anything. But see, then you go over to the world and you look for peace in the world and you don't find it. So all that you have left is to turn on Christians and on Christianity and on the Bible and spend your time ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's how it works. I understand. I understand it very well. And you know what? You have to become a fool. Just be simple-minded. Understand the simple pleasures of life. Understand what it's really all about. That's where you'll find your peace. That's where you'll find your joy my recommendation so um, you can watch the salvation message I have a lot of different things take you through the scriptures tell you what it means to be a Christian not a churchgoer not a Roman Catholic not a Protestant okay not a Muslim not a Jew not a Buddhist not a Hindu not a just have a relationship with the Creator you come out here you can walk through the woods and say you know something I can study what man has learned about birch bark. I can study that and I can say, what are the constituents? What are the properties of this? Is there a medicinal quality to this? How about uh, the sap and this fir tree? It's very interesting. What about these birds? What about these leaves? What about this? What about that? I'd like to learn. I like to study things. But you see, I've come to the knowledge of the truth. The truth is there is a God. And if I put Him in the driver's seat, I can just sit back and enjoy life. Enjoy the simple things. Not have to go around and saying, well, religion is the opiate of the masses. And, and um, I want to just spend my time in nothing else but to hear or tell some new thing and, and try to save up money and impress people that I don't like. Um, and advance in my career and everything else. And I, I don't want to have children because that might be a bad decision for the environment or something. Um, no, you know what? I'm going to use the Bible as my road map. I'm going to read through the Bible and say, what does the Bible have to say about me having children? What does the Bible say about my career? What does the Bible say about the future? What does the Bible say about the past? What does the Bible say about man? God, you get in the driver's seat because I'm lost. 
I lost my way a long time ago. Um, I was a professing Christian way back when, when I got saved. Raised going to church. And I would read this Bible and it was so foreign to me and I'd think, my life isn't anything at all like the people there in this book. I believe that there is a God, but I don't know Him. If I died today, would I go to heaven? I have no idea. I really don't know. Well, I'll just go to church more. I don't want to go to church more. Um, something doesn't seem right there. Little did I know. And I remember I came out of my art studio the one time really late at night. And I was just so burned out going to the art shows and everything else and trying to find happiness and peace and that. And getting into better shows all the time, it was not that my career was ending, it was actually taking off. But I had no joy. And I thought, I thought there was supposed to be more joy when I when, and more successful. But I'm not finding it. And I walked out and I remember I looked up in the sky at night and there was a bunch of stars up there in the night sky and I said, God, I know you're real. I believe in you. But I have no idea what my purpose in life is. And I want wisdom. Little did I know that James chapter 1 in this Bible says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth all men liberally and upbraideth not. God will not condemn you. God will not make fun of you if you ask for wisdom. He's ready. He's willing to give you His wisdom, not philosophy that spoils you. That is going to be it. Thank you very much for watching. And um, I hope that some of you out there listen. Okay, see you in the next video.